Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to welcome Rebecca Solnit to Story Hour. Um, Rebecca is a California native. She received an undergraduate degree in literature from San Francisco State and then enrolled here at the journalism school here at Cal. She worked as an editor and museum researcher, and in 1990, she published her first book, Secret Exhibitions, about six California artists who played major parts in the thriving but sparsely documented avant-garde of the 50s. In her, an interview, she's recorded as saying, I really found my voice when I began to write about California and the West and tell the histories that I should have been told. Her next book, Savage Dreams, A Journey into the Landscape Wars of the American West, documents another kind of Western history altogether. Savage Dreams ranges from 1851, uh, when a brigade of the US Army attacked and removed the native inhabitants of what was to become the Yosemite National Park, to the 1950s, when the military began to test nuclear bombs in Nevada, and to the recent past, when Yucca Mountain was chosen to be a radioactive waste dump. So in the 11 books, in those two books, and in the 11 and books and numerous essays she's published since then, Rebecca has extended this already omnivorous curiosity into a dazzling range of interests. And I'm quoting here from the official bio, art, landscape, public and collective life, ecology, politics, hope, meandering, reverie, and memory. Her writings also embody a clear-eyed and compassionate political awareness. She has worked as an activist and investigating journalist on numerous issues, including climate change, Native American land rights, nuclear dangers, human rights, and war. So I, I was going to try and summarize the entire career, then I realized that <laughs> I'd be here forever. So I'm just going to use one book uh, as a sort of exemplar, and that book is River of Shadows, uh, an exemplar of this range and depth. The book is a biography of the 19th century inventor and photographer Edward Mybridge. It is also, as the subtitle tells us, an investigation of the technological Wild West. Mybridge was hired in 1872 by Leland Stanford, a land-grabbing railroad baron, to settle a bet. When horses gallop, do all four hooves ever simultaneously leave the ground? So Mybridge, who was kind of a clever fellow, rigged together cameras with trip ropes and made the first ever locomotion study sequence. He then put these photographic sequences into a box he called a zootrope, which showed viewers the world's first moving pictures. Thomas Edison saw a zootrope in 1888, and so movies were born. The New York Times said about River of Shadows that it was, and I quote, a brilliant essay on my bridge and all he begat. It is, all at once and in no particular order, a brief summation of a man's life, a meditation on time, image, and motion, a history of the American West as a fund of technological innovation and perceptual change, and a beautiful piece of prose. It belongs to that wondrous class of books in which an extraordinary mind seizes hold of an unexpected topic and renders it with such confidence, subtlety, and grace that one finds it hard to remember what things looked like before the book appeared in the world." End quote. River of Shadows received a Guggenheim, the National Books Critics Circle Award in Criticism, the Lannan Literary Award, and the Hacker Prize from the Society of the History of Technology. Rebecca is currently a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine and frequent contributor to TomDispatch.com. She lives in San Francisco. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Solnit. Thank you. It's a huge pleasure to be here. I, one of the funny things about the life I didn't really anticipate uh, I was going to have is that being a nonfiction research writer is a lot like never graduating. Uh, it's great Vic mentioned River of Shadows. I researched it in Bancroft Library, Doe, Moffat, and, uh, and uh, about three other libraries. I use the libraries here regularly and uh, feel it. And, in so many ways, I'm still a student here, so it's lovely to be back. And thank you so much for bringing me. I'm going to read from two things. Uh, one actually has to do with Edward Moybridge, and the other is from a forthcoming book. And the, there are two shorter pieces that could be called together of longing and haunting. I felt like it was really time for stories. Um, this, this first essay is called The Eyes of the Gods. It's from Infinite City, the Atlas of San Francisco I did. 
And one of the things I remember when I was teaching at the journalism school at Berkeley of several years ago, my students were such good researchers, and then they would spend 90 hours researching a story, and then they'd give themselves two hours to write it. And I'd be like, no, 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 I want you to find stories that you don't have to do any research on, where it's all on the writing. One of the nice things about getting older is you accumulate this kind of storehouse of preoccupations, obsessions, trivial pieces of information that will fall into place later, um, sort of pet ideas, obsessions, uh, uh, you know, and patterns emerge, etc. One of the maps in Infinite City is a map of Edward Muybridge of the San Franciscan inventing the technology that would become motion pictures, and Alfred Hitchcock, another Englishman who fell in love with San Francisco, making the movie Vertigo, one of my favorite movies. And so I'd done a book about Moybridge. In my book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, I'd also written about Vertigo, um, which I min have a mi had a minor obsession with, or maybe it was a major obsession. Do, how do we know what scale an obsession is? If you have an obsessionometer, come, come up to me afterwards. At, um, so, and it was wonderful sort of bringing them together on the map. One of the things I love about maps is that space exists absolutely and precisely, and time doesn't necessarily exist at all. So this man who died in 1904 could coexist on the map with a movie that was filmed in the mid-1950s and released in San Francisco in 19, May of 1957. And of course, um, every, almost every map in the book has an essay. To make it fast and easy, I wrote a lot of them myself, And um, although it's a book with 30 collaborators. And this one I certainly wasn't going to let anyone get near because it was too delicious. And because the ideas at work were too peculiar for anyone else to adapt to. So, the eyes of the gods. The Kauias of the southeastern California desert tell a story in which the creators of the world argue about death. One of the gods is against it because it is, after all, sad. And the other one points out that without death, the earth will get very crowded. For historians and people preoccupied with the past, the city is seen and imagined is crowded with ghosts, and the past walks through the present. We are ourselves ghosts of other times, not fully present in our own. And we see what is no longer here and feel the future as a wind through the streets, a wind that is for us who look backward, always blowing away what we cherish, the storm of loss. But when solid time melts, the past can be claimed. Imagine that time does not exist, and the photographer Edward Moybridge moves through a wavering, foggy city also inhabited by another Englishman, Alfred Hitchcock, as he films Vertigo, his 1957 movie about fear, longing, remorse, fantasy, and San Francisco. The fat director is working in the medium his lean compatriot laid the foundations for during his own restless years in San Francisco and Palo Alto. In that period, Moybridge sped up photography, which before him could only capture the slow world for what moved, blurred, in those early photographies. The world stopped for Moybridge's camera. I'm sorry, no, the, the world stopped for the Victorian camera. It froze, it posed. Moybridge made photography fast. He was the fastest camera in the West, and then he shot horses and men in motion and shot them in split-second series that could be projected to simulate motion and thereby simulate life. It was as though the ice of frozen photographic time had broken free into a river of images. Brought to life, we say, because motion is essence of life. And with that invention, the world changed. Moybridge's new medium of photographic motion, moving pictures, was itself ghostly, unearthly, though within the limits of the new medium before flexible celluloid films came along. He made only short looping segments of horses and men in motion. He had made a medium that blurred past and present, and people in his time saw how haunted it was. As Thomas Edison tinkered to see if sound and image could be harnessed together into a yet more comprehensive reconst reconstitution of past time, he proposed wildly, and these are Edison's exact words, that grand opera could be given at the Metropolitan Opera House of New York with artists and musicians long since dead which suggests what seances they were holding, what grave robbing we do now in the medium of movies. In, the fi in film, we see the dead all the time. Watch the film, 
vertigo tomorrow and see that Jimmy Stewart, who died in 1997, as Scotty is still a rangy man in his prime, pacing, scowling, and pining, and changing, chasing the phantasm of the icy goddess Madeline through a San Francisco whose downtown is not yet spiky with skyscrapers, but whose streets are oddly familiar. Of course, Vertigo is a story within a story that was, is a movie that was filmed in reality. The reality of the city, the real that makes the illusion all the more compelling. For San Franciscans, the film features f fictional characters, but real actors loosed on a real and familiar city. And maybe Vertigo is a perfect example of film, for it's about uncertain boundaries between realities and illusion, about a passion that can never grasp, about haunting and losing. The fictitious Madeline, a woman hired to ensnare Scotty by impersonating a financier's suicide, si suicidal, dreamy, evasive wife who is never actually seen in the movie, claims to be haunted by her ancestress, the less, uh, uh, also a suicide. The less fictitious Scotty is haunted by Madeline, though she may not exist. The ice blonde dies, and he forces a sales girl who resembles her to impersonate his lost Madeline, changing her hair and her clothes, inventing her and erasing the woman he'd met, and the chance at real love. Thus in the film, she dies twice, or perhaps three times. Time does not quite exist, but death does, emphatically. And as in so much film noir and several surrealist books on the city, the beloved is really the eternally elusive, unpossessable city itself, forever slipping through fingers like water, but never entirely gone. Film haunts, and cities are haunted. Moybridge's own story is a little like Vertigo, or his personal story is a story of people who might not be who they were supposed to be, of deceptions, betrayals, uncertain identities, and a murder, all threaded through the decade in which he made his technological breakthrough that led to cinema. Story in the Hollywood sense, for much of Moybridge's life has no story, no personal drama that we know of, though it has a long arc of self-invention that began with his emigration, was furthered by his name, name changes. Edward Muggeridge became, in stages, Edward Moybridge, and his launch into the medium in which he'd, he would do such astounding things. In 1871, he married a beautiful young blonde divorcee, Flora Stone, sometimes also known as Lily Shawcross, who deceived him with a man who called himself Harry Larkins and came to town streaming a trail of lies. While Moybridge was off chasing landscape images, Larkins haunted theaters and took Flora with him, who was an actor himself, a confidence man out of nowhere, whose short known past involved cheating a foolish young man out of considerable money, but who told glamorous stories about himself, stories of having fought with Italy's revolutionaries, been a member of the Foreign Legion and a soldier in the British Army, then a Raja in India with a trunk full of diamonds, lost, somehow lost along with various other fortunes. Flora paid the ex-Raja's laundry bills. They were quintessential San Franciscans. These people were self-made men and women, and sometimes self-invented or just made up. The possibility that his son might have a to have a shadowy identity as Larkin's son sent Moybridge on a furious expedition to the Mercury Mine east of Calistoga, where Larkin's was in residence. There, that dark October night in 1874, the photographer shot the dra drama clip critic an inch below the left nipple, as the San Francisco Chronicle dutifully reported. The murderer Moybridge was held for trial, exonerated by a Wild West jury of husbands who thought the punishment suited the crime, and then exiled himself to Central America for many months. He'd begun his great project of turning photography into a faster medium that could apprehend the world, the world in motion, but the murder disrupted the project for a few years. Aboard a ship on his return from Central America, Moybridge solved, he said, the problem of high-speed photography that was one of the technical challenges to be surmounted on the path to cinema. He also made breakthroughs in the chemistry of film, speeding it up so that exposures of fractions of a second were possible. I've been both a ghost and haunted in the city I love, the city Moybridge hit photographed, Hitchcock filmed, and I've been possessed as well by the movies I've seen in its old theaters. 
One of the signs of a good movie is how it lingers after you leave. And this aftertaste of enchantment happens most effectively with films seen in the contemplative zone of a theater. This piece is also an argument for actually seeing movies in theaters, not on your phone. Something very, very, very different happens. I think going to see a movie in a theater is like going to church. There's all these rituals, the communion of the popcorn, at, uh, you know, the magic ticket, the dressing up, and... Uh, uh, you know, all these rituals, the trailers, and there's something really quite extraordinary about sitting together in the dark with complete strangers, hundreds of them, as though you're dreaming together in those places that used to be called dream palaces. Um, watching things on your phone just isn't like that at all. <laughs> no ritual, no structure, no, no communion with strangers, not much darkness, um, so... But And this aftertaste of enchantment happens most effectively with films seen in the contemplative zone of a theater. Often, leaving a theater, I enter a night in which the mood, the characters, the spectacles and possibilities all seem to carry on the sensibility of what was just seen on the screen, as though the film had been an incantation, bringing the world into its vision. When Vertigo was released, there were about 70 movie theaters in the city, far more than now when movies have moved to this far less ceremonial spaces of multiplexes. At best, for there are also DVDs and downloads for various kinds of screens at home, and even watched on airplanes and other places. But the old theaters were sometimes called dream palaces, and dreaming was then was done collectively, in the dark, with rituals, with appointed times and places, and it had another kind of, pa of magic. Anyone who grew up going to movies knows the steps, the arrival in the vicinity, the examination of film schedules or movie posters out front, especially if there's a line, and the charms of a line of people all anticipating the same pleasure. The purchase of the ticket, often at one of those glassed-in booths facing the street, the ticket torn from a roll and made of a particular kind of soft, fibrous colored cardboard, red most often, slimes orange or lavender or gray, to be found later crumpled in pockets. Then the taking of the ticket, the promenade past the refreshment stand, the aroma of popcorn, the worn carpet of lobbies, and then the filing down dark aisles to the rows of velvet folding chairs, and maybe the argument about what constitutes an ideal seat. I even love the trailers which serve as advertisements, but also as mad little movies, cramped up like a peony before bloom, a butterfly and chrysalis, everything smashed in together, a burst of what you didn't choose before the launching of what you did. In a strange way, the intensity of cinematic magic literally came home to me some years ago. For a long time, I lived across the street from a building that was for several years an AIDS hospice called the House of Love, run by white sari-wearing nuns in Mother Teresa's order. She came by a few times herself. After her death, the nuns left, and the big Victorian building became just another San Francisco collective household, though the residents held on to the name House of Love held huge rave parties, grew a Rousseau-like jungle in the old storefront downstairs, and showed movies. Or rather, one of the roommates whose bay window faced my kitchen window screened movies for himself with a DVD projector that turned his back wall into a theater of flickering faces and acts. I'd get out of a taxi at midnight and stand mesmerized for 10 minutes, key in hand, as huge figures loomed and jumped on that wall, or I'd watch those silent movies for a while from my room across the street. That little impromptu home theater with its giant faces and careening motion lurching inside the house reminded me how supernatural movies once were, and still are, given an arena to exercise their full power of uncanniness. A whole dinner party in my kitchen halted once trying to identify the movie in the window during an episode featuring local actor Nick Cage's lugubrious face about nine feet high. You could picture a body filling up the house to go with that head, a giant folded up inside a wooden box, Alice after one of her drink me moments. On that happy, strange evening of Nick, Nicolas Cage as an apparition, the filmmakers in San Francisco aficionados Sam Green and Chip Lord sat at my kitchen table with me, puzzling out his looming, flickering face, long before Sam had begun his beautiful movie about the city's fog. But after Chip had completed his video splicing the hilly car chase scenes in Vertigo and Bullet into one dreamy Mobius strip of cars, plunging at various speeds through an impossible typo topography. 
Perhaps the man whose face we were watching was at dinner elsewhere in the city that was also his home. In my early teens, when my mother worked in San Francisco, I would take the bus in and join her in watching black and white Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers movies at the Castro Theater. Its broad arc of seats, its, ornament, its ornamental box seat, seat balconies, its oxidized gilt and its great ceiling mural of the Zodiac with a pendulum-like central or ornament dangling from its center are all still there in this theater in which I've seen so many Westerns, seen film festival offerings, silent movies, Antonioni and Tarkovsky and Kurosawa festivals, all the classics, seen Milk, the movie about the mayor of Castro Street made doubly magical by the fact that the street outside and the theater itself kept showing up on the screen. The gay men in the dark with me taught me with sniggers and murmurs and sighs up and down the rows about reading the sexual subtext and preposterous elements of movies, about how to enjoy the homoeroticism of Westerns such as The Magnificent Seven, the spectacle of over-the-top femininity, the endless supply of unlikely plot twists and overwrought emotions. But the sublime stuck around. It's a big theater with a big screen and the supernatural splendor I'd found in my neighbor's dark room, I found again in the close-ups at the Castro. In Once Upon a Time in the West, the camera comes closer and closer to Charles Bronson's squinting eyes, and you expect the camera, as conventional American cameras would have, to stop when his face fills the screen. A head as big and obdurate as one of those giant Toltec stone heads, but the camera travels f inward and further in until the glare of his two staring, narrowed eyes fills the great sail of the screen. It's as though God were looking at you, for if there's one attribute of the medieval divinity that makes sense cinematically, it's that he's gigantic, looming, a force that fills the sky and fills your heart with fear. There's a little 12th century church up in the Pyrenees Mountains on the pilgrimage route from Paris to Santiago de Compostela, the Church of Saint Foy de Conc. And on its western facade, the saint herself is shown, a tiny figure bent in prayer towards a huge hand coming out of the sky, wonderful and terrifying. Charles Bronson's fierce pale eyes were that big. They haunt me still. They're what I see when I picture that screen. In the creation myth of the Kawiya, the creators argue about death. One of the gods is against it because it is after all sad, and the other one points out that without it, the earth will get very crowded. Film has given us the ghosts who make it crowded and who make us ghosts wandering through time and place, dissolve the solidity of these categories and set us all free to haunt and be haunted in many places and in my place, in the city of cinema, the city in which you dwell with Madeline, with Moybridge, with strangers in the dark, with the ghosts among whom you are yourself a ghost, your own eyes like those of a god's, for thanks to cinema, you too see the dead now. Thank you. And I'm going to read another essay about the same length. I have a book coming out in May called uh, The Far Away Nearby. And it's about empathy, illness, and storytelling, particularly fairy tales. When I was younger, I think I felt like I wrote books. And as I get older, I'm also really interested in making books. One of the joys of the atlas, um, which is over there on the table, it's 22 full page, full spread maps in full color um, with the most gorgeous atlas title page, maybe since the 19th century, thanks to the amazing artist, Alison Pebworth, and lots of other um, delicious things. One of the things I love about that is it will never be on Kindle. And I think there's something about the physical space of a book. You know, a book is a treasure box that opened for, and they all opened for me when I learned how to read. And uh, that huge amount and the whole history packed into a novel that somehow, you know, the whole world that opens out of a box, the magic of that still astounds me. And so this book is structured like a Russian doll, and it has something... It will have something that we did in Wanderlust. In Wanderlust, we ran a line of quotes all the way across the bottom of the pages, and this will have a continuous uh, four, 14th chapter. It's officially a 13-chapter book. 
uh, running along the bottom as a kind of thread of narrative, but also a literal thread, um, a narrative line that ties everything together. And I'm going to read that. Um, it's I designed it kind of as yardage. The designers will tell me if it's too long or too short, and I'll uh, tweak it to make it fit. And as my editor said, God knows how we'll do this for electronic books, but it will be uh, a pleasure for paper books. So with no further ado, because that was quite a lot of ado. At, um, Moths drink the tears of sleeping birds. This is the title of a short scientific report from 2006. And the moths are a species on the island of Madagascar named Hemiceratoides hieroglyphica. But the title is a sentence, and the sentence reads like a ballad of one line, or history compressed down to its barest essentials. There are two protagonists in it, a sleeper and a drinker, a giver and a taker, and what is tears to the former is food to the latter. The story tells us everything we ever wanted a story to tell. There is difference. There is contact. You can feed on sorrow. Your tears are delicious. Moths drink the tears of sleeping birds. The sentence can run away from you until you've forgotten science and the lack of sor sorrow in the tears of birds, in this case magpie robins and Newtonia birds, and remembered your own tears and pictured an asymmetrical relationship where one sleeps and one is awake, one yields and one acquires, one is being and the other doing. The moth is alert at work, stealing tears and flying through the night, because there's also night in this sentence and wings of two kinds, as though the characters were day and night themselves, or as if the drinker fed on the dreamer the way the moon reflects the light of the unseen sun. That moths drink the tears of sleeping birds is a template for many things. It is a container of the familiar made strange, of sorrow turned into sustenance, of the myriad stories the natural world provides that are as uncannily resonant as any myth. The ancient Greeks used the word psyche for breath, for life, for the vital essence of life, for the soul, and sometimes for butterflies that were the emblem of the soul. In the tale of Cupid and Psyche, an ancient woman tells to calm a weeping girl midway through the second century Roman novel, the Golden Ass. Psyche is a wanderer whose odyssey begins when she's brought to her own funeral pyre in the mountains and abandoned there. In this tale that has all the hallmarks of what would become the classic fairy tales of female seekers, she awakens alone in a palace. There an unknown unseen lover visits her only at night. In paintings, Cupid, her the unknown lover, is often portrayed with the wings of a bird, Psyche with those of a butterfly. Nevertheless, it is he that is the moth, coming at night, feeding on her, ravishing her in the dark, laying low by day. The rest of the old tale is familiar, urgent to suspicion and curiosity by her jealous sisters. The girl with butterfly wings acquires a desire to see him. Psyche lights a lamp in the darkness. It drips one burning drop of oil that scalds sleeping love with pain, who reacts as if he never before knew pain, and perhaps he didn't. Perhaps gods don't until some mortal violates the rules to look at them and burns them with the sorrow of their gaze, the sorrow that belongs to us and not to them. So often in these myths we hear of how the human becomes divine, immortal, impervious, but there should be a story heading in another direction, whereby a god becomes human for love because of pain. Love has been burned and made visible, and he flees. To regain her bird-winged love, Psyche must sort by evening a mountain of several kinds of grain and mix together an impossible task until a throng of ants carries out the work on her behalf. A reed, an eagle, and a tower help her with subse subsequent tasks. The whole overlooked voiceless world speaks with her and seems to be on her side. The tale of Cupid and Psyche is told by an old woman held captive by thieves. Sorry. And the tale of Cupid and Psyche is told by an old woman held captive by thieves in the Golden Ass, a novel written in Latin about 160 AD by the North African Apuleius. A novel that, like the Arabian Nights, contains tales within tales. Though the old woman bent with age is poor and abject, the tale she tells is of princesses and gods, one of the great allegories of love and the evolution of the soul. 
You can read Cupid and Psyche as a romance in a literal sense, or as the attempt of consciousness and desire to reconcile, to find a way to coexist. Read this way, they are not two beings, but two aspects of a being. After, after Psyche's tasks are completed and the lovers are reunited, she gives birth to immortal pleasure. Moths drink the tears of sleeping birds, and love like that of Cupid and Psyche is only one kind of symbiosis. Some species of yucca plant and of moth depend upon each other. The white moths hatch out of their cocoons as the white flowers of the yuccas open. The moths mate and the females pollinate the flowers while laying her eggs in them, so they will produce the fruit on which her offspring will feed. The yucca survives only by the pollination efforts of this moth. The moth larvae survive only by consuming this particular fruit. They would not exist without each other, and yuccas of those species grown elsewhere have to be hand-pollinated. Not all meals for moths are so exquisite or particular, though. A lot of butterflies and moths engage in what is called puddling, landing on pools of water, piles of manure, rotting fruit to feed. Moths of the genus Cal Calperta, sometimes known as vampire moths, feed on vertebrate blood, and a dozen or more species of moths visit the eyes of mammals to drink fluids that provide protein, salts, and other minerals. Mostly males drink from these sources, and their meals give them resources for the spermatophores they provide to the female of their species, a packet that contains their genes to fertilize her, her eggs, but also nutrients to help feed the female and help create their offspring. No other animal give quite, gives a gift quite like that. People like to think about butterflies and moths as though they were flying flowers, but they are fierce insects struggling through each phase of life, spending time as caterpillars, bursting skins, dissolving selves in chrysalises and cocoons, where they actually become almost completely liquid before they recoalesce into something utterly different than they were before. Mating in intense in various intense and lengthy ways, devouring plant poisons to make themselves inedible, extending their extraordinary long tongues at manure and puddles. I've seen the black tongue of a two-tailed swallowtail extending like a whip into the pile of dung, the beautiful yellow and black and blue-winged creature sat upon. Moths drink the tears of sleeping birds, and other moths feed at the eyes of deer, elephants, water buffalo. There are crocodile tears and moths that feed on them. In the forests of Southeast Asia, several species that feed at the eyes of human beings were documented by the patient entomologist Hans Banziger, who remained still while they found him and fed at his, as he reported in, Remarkable new cases of moths drinking human tears in Thailand, in the Natural History Bulletin of Siam 20 years back. He photographed one drinking from his own right eye, looking with its furry wings outspread like a tremendous tear or a misplaced brooch or a flower petal, an ornament invading his face. When another species came and drank, he wrote, I then caught the moth by cautiously lowering the wide net over my head and the moth. Moths drink the tears. The word for tear drinkers is la lacryphagous, and for the eaters of human flesh, it is anthropophagous. There's some cannibals in this forthcoming book. And by about this point, we might have mentioned them. But, but so, And the rest of us feed on sorrow all the time. It is the essence of many of the most beautiful ballads and pop songs, and why sorrow and heartbreak are so delicious might have to do with the emotion it stirs in us, the empathy for others' suffering, and the small comfort of not being alone with our own. With a sad song, we feel a delicate grief, as though we mourn for three minutes a loss we can't remember, but taste again, sorrow like salt tears, and then close it up like a letter in the final notes. Sadness, the blue like dusk, the reminder that all things are ephemeral, and that because there is time, there is change, and that another name for change, if you look back towards what is vanishing in the distance, is loss. But sadness is also beautiful, maybe because it rings so true and goes so deep, because it's also about the distances in our lives, the things we lose, the abyss between what the lover and the beloved 
want and imagine and understand, that may widen to become unbridgeable at any moment, the distance between the hope at the outset and the event eventual outcome, the journeys we have to travel, including the last one out of being and on past becoming, into the unimaginable, the moth flown into the pure dark, or the flame. Australia's golden sun moth lives a long time underground, feeding on wallaby grasses, and then metamorphoses into a moth without a mouth that has a few days to live, mate, copulate, reproduce on stored energy, then dies. Other moths and butterflies also live brief lives without eating. And yet other moths drink the tears of sleeping birds. Sadness always contains distances, spaciousness, takes us away, while well, happiness at best brings us home to this very moment, this very place. So perhaps they are the sentiments of the far and the near. The rage and fear arise from the proximity of the unwanted, as well as the absence or departure or threat of departure of the desired. Sadness and happiness, if these are even useful words, because as the years have gone by, I've wondered if we want other language for emotion, if we would rather speak of deep and, sh and shallow because the things that move people to tears are sometimes joyous, and because the attempts to ward off sadness so often ward off depth instead, by distraction, for example. Certain kinds of beauty make people weep, the moments when hope and history rhyme, the arrival of the long-awaited, the revelation of a pattern in the universe that is also the revelation of your own power of making and perceiving order, and sometimes just extraordinarily intense beauty including moral beauties, justice done, truth honored, order or wholeness restored. Maybe from that we can extract a definition of beauty that has more to do with depths. Beauty is one of the things that makes you cry, and so maybe beauty is always tied up in tears. And maybe we can practice taxonomy, in this case, of the things that produce tears rather than drink them. Pain, sorrow, loss, Joy, pattern, meaning, depth, generosity, beauty, reunion, recovery, recognition and understanding, arrival, love, mortality, precision. Or maybe we can call depth the genus and all these other things the species. Moths drink, birds sleep, there are tears, there are dreams, there is difference. A mature insect, including a moth or butterfly, is called an imago. The plural is imagines, and the cells that bring about that maturity in moths and butterflies and other flyers are called imaginal cells. These cells lie dormant in the larval creature and begin to reinvent it in its mature form, its imago, when the caterpillar has dissolved itself into a thick fluid and its old life is over. It's a death and resurrection at midlife, which most of you are too young to worry about yet, but you will. The other meaning of the word imago is an idealized image of a person, usually a parent, formed early in life. As I was writing this, I went to see my mother and a little way into trying to be, be with her in the era past when she would mur mur murmur more than an occasional word and I would only rarely understand it. I remember that I had a copy of Rilke's Duino Elegies with me and read three of them to her. This is really about how do you talk to somebody who doesn't speak. These conversations get very one-sided and Rilke, you should always have some Rilke in your purse. Uh, Rilke can be, and other things like this can be very useful. In one of the elegies were the words that what we strive to reach was once closer and more real and infinitely tender. Here all is distance, there it was breath. It was a good way to keep talking and I listened to, and the familiar lines became more fiercely elegiac, more stern and wild spoken aloud. Moths drink the tears of sleeping birds. The contemporary poet Robert Haas once wrote of this most solitary of poets, this man who is always putting distance between himself and intimacy. There are pleasures, forms of nourishment perhaps, that most people know, and he did not. What he knew about was the place that that need for nourishment came from. And he knew how immensely difficult it is for us to inhabit that place, to be anything other than strangers to our own existence, 
To learn not to be a stranger is the burden of the Duino elegies. End quote. Moths drink the tears, and the elegies arrived in Rilke's head like visitors from afar. Rilke, a butterfly, butterfly hunter, trying to put himself in the way of strangeness, letting it feed at his tears. In 1912, he'd been walking on the cliff near Duino Castle on the Adriatic when he heard the opening line addressed to an angel. He wrote the first elegy immediately, parts of others soon there, thereafter, in that incredible burst. Of, of creativity, and then he needed to live with his desolation, Haas said. The poet underwent a difficult decade before he finished the 10 poems in another an explosion of imaginative force. Long afterward, I sipped at Rilke's tears. I fed the sound of them and myself to my mother, and perhaps you have fed upon mine. Psyche drips a drop of oil on her love, and to get back to him has to journey through hell and to the ends of the earth. The route is rarely direct. Psyche's story itself wandered north from Italy and became the French tale of Beauty and the Beast, written by Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve in the 18th century. Beauty's kindness and the water she pours upon the beast's dying body, like a baptism or a flood of tears, is what disenchants him and returns him to human form. It's a classic fairy tale where everything wants to return return home to the familiar, to the human, to the happy. The journey in these tales is full circle, but the story itself kept traveling. In Norway, a white bear who speaks with authority comes for the youngest daughter of a poor man who gives her away to provide for the rest of the family. She gets on the bear's back, and the story opens into a subarctic version of Cupid and Psyche. The tale's title, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, comes from the vast distances she goes, helped by the winds to complete her ordeals. She travels on the wind, outwits trolls, and washes out of his shirt the three drops of hot tallow she had dripped onto him at the outset of her crisis. So I, I'm just realizing it doesn't make clear her. She marries the white bear, and at night he becomes a human. It's sort of the opposite of Cupid and Psyche, where he becomes the familiar at night and a bear by day. And um, that what in classical Rome was the god of love appears to be a polar bear in Norway suggests how far stories travel and how little Psyche's spouse's identity matters. He is the perplexing beloved, the one who is unlike and unaccountable and unaccounted for. He is what is lost that must be recovered to be made whole. The white bear is charismatic, an animal by day, a man by night, and you wonder if the old tellers of the tale noted that in the far, far north, he might be animal all the time in the long light of summer, and mostly human during winter's long nights. These marriages to animals are pervasive in the pattern you can trace through so many stories, mostly male animals and female human beings, including the Arctic stories in which a woman marries a dog, a fulmar, a storm petrel, or a handsome stranger who turns out to be bear rather than human. A Tlingit version of the story of the woman who married a bear was told by Maria Johns, a blind old woman, to an anthropologist, Catherine McClellan, on July 16, 1948, near Whitehorse in Yukon Territory, not far from Alaska. The husband sometimes has the form of a man, sometimes a bear, and the wife becomes a bear in the end and is obliged to murder her family after her brothers have killed her husband and driven her into her animal nature. The story explains the kinship between humans and bears and the taboo on eating grizzlies, though it's more than that. It's not a circular tale. Nothing comes back to what, where it started. What is animal remains animal, and what is human goes away. And yet, because of these journeys without return, a kinship arises. A skinned bear looks terrifyingly human, a fanged and muscular man who never was. Moths feed on the tears of sleeping birds. We feed on the tales of loss and generation. The California poet Gary Snyder retells John's story in his essay, The Woman Who Married a, a Bear, and wrote his undergraduate honors thesis on another Northwest Coast story. This one about a chief's son who married a beautiful goose, lost her, searched for her. 
He had managed to marry her because she took her skin off. And those tails being a bear, a swan, a serpent, it's like wearing a costume, a garment. And when they strip naked, it's not so much that they're human, but they're no longer different. And the distance between them can be closed by desire. Perhaps all these stories, these fairy tales and myths, propose that human beings are perpetually naked animals, more a pot potentiality than an identity. The bereft husband of the goose, or the, of the swan, becomes a seagull. The lonely people near me still dance the bear dance, men with black and white lines drawn on their skin, wrapped in bear skin, stepping this way and that, the teeth and ears and fur and claw of the animal silhouetted against the firelight at night when I saw them, this summer actually, so that what was human and what was bear was not so clear. Perhaps what was both was where we resided that evening, as though we'd gone back to the place before we were separate. The native North American stories are not so convinced that human beings are at the center or that when you travel, you come home again. Moths drink the tears of sleeping birds. The birds sleep on, inadvertent givers. The moths fly on, enriched. We feed on sorrows, on stories, on the spaciousness they open up when they let us travel in our imagination beyond our own limits, when they dissolve the boundaries that confine us and urge us to explore the potentialities of our imperfect, broken, incomplete selves and others. Those apricots my brother brought me in three big cardboard boxes long ago, were they tears too? And this book, is it tears? Who drinks your tears? Who has your wings? Who hears your story? Thank you. I think that, that for a nonfiction writer, that was a very story uh, oriented story hour. I hope you enjoyed them. I'm happy to take some questions. At, um, yeah. Um, from that book, uh, Atlas is Extraordinary. And uh, I was wondering if there, are, if there were maps that you had intended to include in the book that you left out, other ideas that you had that you weren't able to include? There was one map that it was an early idea that was way too politically problematic. I wanted to map the Black Panthers in the inner cities of the Bay Area and the return of mountain lions. But mapping you know, black men and animals together gets into some really problematic territory, even though they chose the name Panthers. Uh, and one of the maps that I would love to make about San Francisco, if there's ever a sequel, is um, Yemeni liquor stores and uh, Cambodian donut shops. One of the things that is really fascinating to me about a lot of Asian immigrants is that they have very specific, you know, that they have these territories that families go into. I used to drive around the Southwest a lot, and there are a lot of um, Indian families who owned motels. And it would actually be really tragic. You'd be, this is before reasonably good food had spread so far across the country, young people, where I thought there should be a sign outside San Francisco saying, next cup of coffee, 3,000 miles. <laughs> and you'd walk into these lobbies, and they'd have these exquisite smells. And then you'd have to go eat at Denny's. <laughs> You know, there'd be these incredible curry smells and things. But in San Francisco, the, there's a lot of Yemenis and other Middle Eastern people who have the corner and liquor stores. And apparently there's a whole subculture of Cambodians running donut shops. And there's some other niches like that that are interesting. But I don't have to worry about maps that I might be doing because we're actually most of the way through this. There's this Infinite City is actually the first book of a trilogy with University of California Press. Uh, the second book... Uh, called Unfathomable City, a New Orleans Atlas, will be out a year from November. And it's got delicious maps. It's much more ambitious. We map, at one point, the whole Atlantic and uh, deal with the whole Mississippi drainage and the Caribbean. And um, are there any... I hear there are going to be some geographers here. Are there geographers lurking? At, um, um, okay, hello. And, uh, and then the third and final volume is... Uh, and I should say the second volume's directed with um, Rebecca Snedeker, a native New Orleanian, and the other, just to confuse everyone, it may be the first book ever with two Rebeccas as author. 
And the third book will be co-directed with Astra Taylor, who lives in Brooklyn, and it's called Impossible City in New York Atlas, and we haven't started yet. And, um, you know, so, but, and we're coming up with maps all the time, and people we want to recruit, and uh, it's extre it's it's so much fun, and it's so much work. And so, thank you. Other questions or comments? Le any lepidopterists here, since, you know, I did walk by, by biosciences on my way here. It, um, so, at, um, oh, okay, so everything I said made perfect, s oh, an arm, hello. I, w I have no idea is the really short answer. And there was that time I was trying to convince my journalism students to stop researching, or in their case, kind of interviewing, uh, uh, et cetera, and just write. You know, I, then I file a really elaborate Schedule C, the self-employment form, every year, and I joke that everything I do is deductible because everything I do is research because I, you know, I never know who, who I'm talking to who might say something extraordinary that'll catalyze something five years down the road. You know, I'm constantly kind of making mental notes when I read. And a lot of my work has been about seeing patterns and kind of and history. And so, you know, all this, all the specific uh, data feeds th are, uh, the larger, you know, the larger sense. So um, the proportion, I don't know, but... And it varies so much. And, you know, you can tell with this one, I'd been reading a lot of fairy tales. I actually did some research on moths and butterflies. Um, you know, it was gelling for a while. I once posted that uh, scientific article on Facebook and got a lot of responses, including people writing me poems about moths drinking the tears. At, um, I actually saw the swallowtail last year at Hetch Hetchy um, l licking at the pile of manure. I saw the bear dance this summer. I read the Gary Snyder essay about 20 years ago. You know, it's, it's, there's a kind of journalism where you get a brand new subject, you start from scratch, you go master, you know, nuclear waste or the president's crimes and uh, write about it. And that's kind of the relationship. But there's another kind of nonfiction where you're kind of, you know, at swimming in a sea of interests and fascinations and patterns all the time. And occasionally you try and map a few of them. So... Yeah. I'm just curious, when do you feel that you have enough authority on a topic that you are, were not familiar with before you started researching? And when do you know, personally, when you're ready to actually write about it and feel comfortable that you have enough knowledge about it? It's partly knowledge. It's partly knowing what I have to say, because the knowledge is the raw material, and the essay or writing is what you're going to make with of it. My worst writing is when I try and write prematurely, you know, like I've got six weeks to produce an essay and I'm anxious about it. So it's like trying to, you know, it's like picking something when it's not ripe and, uh, you know, and I've, I'm really bad at, um, I, I prefer getting it relatively right the first time than doing writing crap and then rev massively revising over and over. I am not from the Jack Kerouac school of spontaneous disgorging which I think only Jack Kerouac was very good at anyway. And only after, he was like like a, a jazz musician after a lot of practice. So it really varies. And it's really, and it's funny because I write about everything from, you know, I have a piece about Occupy for the one year anniversary coming out on Sunday with Tom Dispatch. And um, that was a bunch of online stuff and talking to friends involved in Occupy about what's going on, et cetera, as well as kind of some of my overarching themes. So it, it really varies. And authority is such a funny word. I'm an anti-authoritarian by nature. And it's interesting because there have been moments, like there was this delicious, because like I wrote a history of walking and like most people walk, most people think they know something about walking and people got, you know, and it was a book that was about everything. It was about literature, it was about politics, it was about gender, it was about public space and urbanism and the rise of the environmental movement and human anatomy, et cetera. And it was, and I once said that if, um, 
if academics have, if you can imagine an academic field being like a real field, a, you know, a head, a fenced off rectangle, care, carefully tilled, the history of walking trespassed across everybody's field in the course of its uh, meanders. And a lot of my subjects are like that. They're these big, broad, amorphous things you can't exactly be an expert on. The joy of the Moybridge book, it's probably the only thing where there was an era, I'm not, I'm not as up on it, and a few other people have stepped in, but there was an era where um, one other man and I knew more about Edward Moybridge than anybody else on earth. And that was really fun. Although for those of you who've read my essay, men explain things to me. It um, didn't stop uh, cranky guys who didn't know what they're talking about from writing letters to the editor saying that I got, got it wrong. Um, letters to the editor are never fact-checked in case you had, or, or at least in the New York Times and the London Review of Books, those ones weren't. So, you know, but of course, the Moybridge story for me was interesting the way it branched out into much broader things, the industrialization of time and space, the Indian Wars, technology, photography, uh, the American West, uh, and all this much more ethereal stuff I read about. So, you know, nobody's an authority on that. But you can, I don't think, I'm not sure I believe in being an authority, but I believe on being competent. One of the nice things about being trained as a journalist over there at Northgate Hall is that it's really about getting up to speed on a subject and knowing it, you know, being competent with it. It's not being the greatest living scholar on the subject. And it was nice training for, you know, having a good sense of when, when you're competent, what constitutes a fact, who to trust, um, how to research and investigate, et cetera. So, you know, speaking of my lifelong um, um, undergraduate education here and elsewhere. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Rebecca, what's a bad day in the library for you like? I mean, the comic book <laughs> showing is menacing, or is it more than that? Tom, I have a confession to make. I often move more than one shelf at once. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you how many I've moved at once, but uh, the bad day is when you find out everything you want is been ch has been checked out for a year by a faculty member. But one of the, but this is an ultimately egalitarian system because then you just do recall, and um, you know I often feel growing up out here that I wrote a lot of books that I wish I could have just read, and that's something that Vikram was referencing. You know, and that's, it's actually kind of great that I get to write them, but there is this funny thing where you want to understand something and you can't even figure out what library it would be in, who's talked about it, what it fits into, et cetera. And so, you know, I'm often operating in the gap between, you know, I talked about these tilled fields. Maybe there's some no man's lands between those fields of expertise. And, but, you know, in the second half of my life, I will spend more time demanding research librarians help me because there are these f funny things where you can't quite figure out what is the subject, who's written on it, how do you put it together, and uh, things like that. But there are no real bad days in libraries. So every day in the library is a good day. Yeah. You know, I'm still pretty focused on climate change. Uh, we're both friends with a lot of the amazing people in 350.org. Is that a plane? It sounds like bad sound effects and or bad bad audio here. So, and he's he's been very occup very involved with Occupy uh, in San Francisco. It turned into Occupy Bernal Heights, which is a funny little neighborhood for those of you who aren't San Franciscans. And they've been uh, preventing foreclosures in the most amazing way. This Sunday, they went to, there's a guy who owns a bank that was going to foreclose on seven people. And you should know, a lot of these foreclosures are illegal. And they'll, they do this thing called double tracking, where they pretend that they're negotiating with you while they're putting all the paperwork in place to push, to lock you out of your house. And so they've been physically defending foreclosures and doing fantastic things. And Dave has been super involved in the Occupy Wall Street West that'll be happening uh, we, on Monday um, down, downtown, um, easy to find online. So, so we've both been doing those. I'm actually going to New York on Sunday, and I will be occupying Wall Street East on Monday um, and talking at Columbia University on Tuesday. So a balanced diet. But, um, thank you. And uh, yeah. You know, 
there, I, I'm not sure where you got that I was born in California. I was actually born in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Fortunately, we moved to New Mexico within weeks. And, um, but we did, we lived all over before I was five, including about 18 months in Cincinnati. But I've been in the Bay Area since before kindergarten. Actually, it's one of the ways I like to introduce myself that's very relevant here. From kindergarten to graduate school, I am a product of the California public education system. It used to be well-funded. Uh, it used to be free. Um, don't forget that. And, um, you know, it could be, it, it should be put back together the way it was. Uh, in terms of uh, fully funding, funded, et cetera. And the reason all the disrepair is due to greed, but um, I digress. So, you know, I've lived out here. I belong here. I don't really, you know, when you really look at it, the United States is an empire, both because it absorbed all these Native American nations the way empires devour nations, and because it's so damn big. And I, when I got to New York, I feel like I'm in a foreign country. People have really different assumptions about race, class, education, and space. The weather's really different, the food is different, and worse. And, um, you know, it's really, really different. I think there's something, I've, you know, growing up here, and I'm 51 now, things are really different now, but when I was growing up, we were told civilization had happened in Europe and some of it had come to the East Coast and it hadn't trickled all the way west. We were a bunch of barbarians, there was no Western history, the West had gone from um, wilderness to shopping mall in a single uneventful bound. And if you wanted culture, you better start trekking east. It's one of the reasons I love Gary Snyder. He's one of the people who, in the post-war era, really said, I'm going to deal with Native America, I'm going to deal with Asia, and those are the ways I'm going to deal with being here. I'm not going to be a, a discount, fake, you know, European in exile. And one of the things I loved about the Beats is the real insistence on a deeply American kind of poetry. But here we face Asia, we don't face Europe. And I think it's really liberating since we're essentially a Eurocentric culture to have these other influences and be freer of the mothership in some ways. It's really, it's a really different culture in so many ways. And, um, you know, and I feel like I belong here. And I like the landscape, the weather, and the space so much more. And also I've been immersing myself in the histories here since I was... Um, a grad student here. I did my thesis at Berkeley on Wallace Berman, one of the six artists who became the subject of my first book, which was really trying to figure out what did, wh how could, what was an avant-garde on the West Coast? What, what, how, did, how did an artist live out his life or her life out here? So, you know, that knowledge isn't portable. So I'm not, I, I'm not, I will never live east of the Rockies. So I might move around a little, but, you know, so it's funny, I'm infamous for land, I, f I travel way too much because it's part of, it's, the alternative to teaching is talking here and there and lots and lots of writing. And um, although I teach sometimes too and love it, but there's this, like the people who pick me up at the airport, it's a running joke, I land and I say, I'm never leaving home again every time. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I was going to New Mexico this spring and my brother said, I thought you were never leaving home again. And I was like, New Mexico is home. <laughs> so this is home. Why would I go any, any place else for long? So that might be a wonderful place to end. Thank you. Thank you all.